Okay? He gives the example of a man, a father, who has lost his son in death. And so that man goes and, and gets a piece of stone. And to remember that son that died, that man carves out of that stone an image of his son. And in the text here, it says in chapter 14 that that man, you know, he just he would talk to it every day. And it, 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 that stone really became, replaced his son. It was a memorial, right? And he just, that's the way he got over his grief. Grief is just day by day talking to that stone. I'll just read it to you very quickly. Verse 15. For a father consumed with grief and an untimely bereavement made an image of his child who had been suddenly taken from him. He now honored as a God what was once a dead human being. And handed on this, on, uh, handed on to his, his dependents secret rights and initiates. Isn't that sad? See, it just start, started out as a memorial. It started out as a piece of stone that reminded him of his son and uh, whatnot. But pretty soon, the dad dies and they pass that stone on to the next generation. Well, pretty soon, they forget what the stone was, was originally designed for. They forget the purpose of, the, of that stone, that it was a memorial to the son. And they begin to worship it like a god. So that, human, that original human origin of why that stone was made is lost. They don't, even know, they don't even know what it is. They don't even know what it's about. They just started worshiping like a god. Then he gives you another example. He talks about a kingdom who have a king. And this king is distant. He doesn't live close by. And so these people gather, uh, get together, and they make an image to that king. <clears throat> and they, they show reverence to that image and uh, show respect to it and take care of it like, like it was the king himself. Hoping that, that if they did that, it'd be like the king being there. To take care of them. And they start worshiping it like a God. Amen. Are y'all with me here? So I'll read it to you just a little bit. All awake. When people could not honor monarchs in their presence since they lived at a distance, they imagined their appearance far away and made a visible image of the king whom they honored so that by their zeal they might flatter the absent one as though present. Amen. You see that? They desired to please the ruler, verse 19. Um, verse 20, the multitude attracted by the charm of his work, now regarded as an object of worship, the one whom shortly before they had honored as a human being. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm putting you all to sleep. But I get into this, I don't know, I... Maybe you don't, but I do. But anyway, so God deals with this, this, fall, this uh, you know, false worship and, and the digression of that false worship and where it came from and how it was forgotten. The origins were thought, forgotten. And people just started worshiping these things, you know. <laughs> and uh, they were human representations of human beings. And then not only that, but the sad part about it is it goes on and tells you that they, already got, they also got involved in worshiping animals. Zoolatry. Now, the, the Egyptians did a lot of that, you know. All right? But in the midst of that false worship, I'll just give you an idea of what it produces. Verse 22 of chapter 14, Then it was not enough for them to err about the knowledge of God, but though living in great strife due to ignorance, they call such, they call such great evils peace. Now, you tell me we don't live in this, that time right now where people worship themselves. And the evil that's in culture today, they call it peace. The confusion is because of the idolatry. 15 verse 1, but you're our God, our kind and true, patient and ruling all things in mercy. For even if we sin, we are yours, knowing your power. But we will not sin because we know that you acknowledge us as yours. 
For to know you is complete righteousness and to know your power is the root of immortality. For neither has the evil intent, and I'm reading chapter 15 verse 4, of human art misled us, nor the fruitless toil of painters, a figure stained with varied colors, whose appearance arouses yearning in fools, so that they desire the lifeless form of dead image, lovers of evil things, and fit for sub- such objects of hope are those who either make or desire or worship them. Isn't that sad? Verse 11, here's the reason. Because they failed to know the one who formed them and inspired them with active souls and breathed the living spirit into them. But they considered our existence an idle game and life a festival held for profit. For they say one must get money however we can, even by base means. For these persons, more and more others know that they sin when they make from earthly matter fragile vessels and carved images. Isn't that sad? They pray to him for possessions, his marriage and children. He is not ashamed to address lifeless things. For health, he appeals to a thing that is weak. For life, he prays to a thing that is dead. For hate, he entreats a thing that is utterly inexperienced. For prosperous journey, a thing that cannot take a step. For money making and work and success with his hands, he has strength, a thing whose hands have no strength. Because they failed to know the one who formed them and inspired them with active souls and breathed the living spirit in them. But they considered our existence an idle game. Verse 18 of chapter 15. Moreover, they worshipped even the most hateful animals, which are worse than all others when judged by their lack of intelligence. And even as animals, they are not so beautiful in appearance that one would desire them. But they have escaped both the praise of God and his blessing. Therefore, those people were deservedly punished through such creatures and were tormented by the multitude of animals. Instead of of this punishment, you showed kindness to your people. See, this is God in contrast to those idols. Amen. 16 verse 5, your wrath did not continue to the end. Verse 7, but you, the Savior of all. Verse 12, but it is your word, O Lord, that heals all people. So over and over again, the illustration is given. The contrast for living for for God and those who don't live for God. And that salvation and deliverance comes to those who obey His Word. In contrast to that, judgment comes upon those who disobey Him. So in the last chapter, as I come to a close, verse 19 of chapter 19. For land animals were transformed into water creatures. And creatures that swim moved over the land. Isn't that amazing? That God allowed land animals to move through the sea. Amen? Amen? And creatures that swim moved over the land. When did that happen? At the time of the Exodus, the Red Sea. By the wisdom of God, they walked through the Red Sea. And land animals, if you will, human beings, were transformed into water creatures. And water creatures moved over the land. That's the frogs, you know. Amen? See, God's showing you how you find deliverance. How you find salvation. Fire, even in water, retained its normal power. Think about that. This is a picture of the Red Sea. There was fire that was there. 
Fire, even in water, retained its normal power. It, the fire, water didn't quench it. And water forgot its fire-quenching nature. Flames, on the contrary, failed to consume the flesh of perishable creatures that walked among them, nor did they melt the crystalline, quick-melting kind of heavenly food. For in everything, O Lord, you have exalted and glorified your people, and you have not neglected to help them all times in all places. See, God is actively involved in history. And if you want to be saved, if you want to be delivered, then walk in obedience to his wisdom, to his word. Amen. If you don't, the judgments come. Hallelujah. The unrighteous live for now. The righteous live for eternity. And brothers and sisters, the way you think and the way I think determines how you live and how you act. If you live by the word of God, you're going to live by the word of God. You're going to act like a Christian. You're going to act like you think. If you don't think right, you're not going to live right and you're not going to act right. And if you live right and you act right based on the word of God and you seek salvation from God, God's going to bring deliverance to you. But judgment upon the wicked is assured in these texts. Amen. The ultimate end of that is the judgment of God Almighty. Amen. So I close with that, cha- with that verse that I began with, and that's chapter 5. Having looked at the contrast between the wicked and the righteous in chapters 1 through 6, chapter 3 shows you the results of those two different kinds of lifestyle. One, eternal life, one, judgment. When you get to chapter 5, we see the very unrighteous see the righteous in the presence of God. When the unrighteous see them, they will be shaken with dreadful fear. They will be amazed at the unexpected salvation of the righteous. They will speak to one another in repentance and in anguish of spirit they will groan and say, These are persons who we once held in derision and made a byword of reproach fools that we were. We thought that their lives were madness and their end was without honor. Why have they been numbered among the children of God? And why is their their lot among saints? So it was. We who strayed from the way of truth and the light of righteousness did not shine on us. And the sun did not rise upon us. We took our fill of the paths of lawlessness and destruction, and we journeyed through trackless deserts. But the way of the Lord we have not known. What has our arrogance profited us, our pride? And what good has our boast, boasted wealth brought us? All those things have vanished like a shadow. Verse 15, but the righteous live forever. And their reward is with the Lord. The Most High takes care of them. Therefore, they will receive a glorious crown and a beautiful diadem from the hand of the Lord. Because with his right hand, he will cover them. and With his arm, he will shield them. The Lord will take his zeal as his whole armor and will arm all creation to repel his enemies. He will put on righteousness as a breastplate and wear impartial justice as a helmet. He will take holiness as an invincible shield and sharpen stern wrath for a sword. And creation will join with him to fight against his frenzied foes. Shafts of lightning will fly with true aim and will leap from the clouds to the target as from a well-drawn bow. Hellstones full of wrath will be hurled as from a catapult. The water of the sea will rage against them and rivers will relentless overwhelm them. A mighty mighty wind will rise against them and like a tempest it will winnow them away. Lawlessness will lay waste the whole earth and evil doing will overturn the thrones of rulers. Amen. Approximately 6,000 years of sin from Adam to this day of people in this world who have rejected God 
and refuse to walk in his word, his wisdom. 6,000 years of sin, debauchery, immorality, ungodliness, idolatry has brought the world to where it is today. The corruption that's in the world today, the problems that's in the world today, the unique feeling that we have right now in this last days is because 6,000 years of sin is being judged by God. Jesus is the answer. As was preached Sunday night. He is the only answer. And departing from sin, forsaking sin, repenting and turning to God with all of your heart. And begin to live by his word. So that the spirit that created the heavens and the earth, the spirit of God. The one that keeps everything together. The one who is available to you. The one who is willing to live inside of you and save you is the only answer that you have. But you can feel 6,000 years of sin is, is converging right now. And that's why there are the problems that we have today. The answer is Jesus Christ. So I appreciate your patient listening tonight. Let's stand. Father God, we thank you tonight that you have showed us as your people the need for salvation that is only found in you and your word. Thank you for showing us the contrast between the ungodly and the godly. And thank you for showing that their intentions are to destroy the people of God because the people of God demand that lives be lived according to his word. And to them it is absurd, strange. They refuse to and do not want to live according to it. But Lord, we as the people of God, let us be encouraged tonight to be faithful to you, to your covenant. That your covenant does have a requirement upon us to live holy. To know God as we do that in the end we will have immortality, eternal life. Let us live with that in mind. And when temptation comes, the offer comes to experience the pleasures of sin for a season. Temptations come to cause us to depart from you. Let us say no to the world and the sin. And live, even though we may be miserable at times, for that eternal outcome of being with you forever and ever. In Jesus' name. Amen. I heard a man preach not long ago. Listen to him preach. Just happened to be just a few days ago. It's interesting that as uh, I taught you this tonight, a man by the name of Wayne Huntley, a major a master preacher, an apostolic preacher. Uh, we've heard him preach many years ago in person. He preached a message, and that message was, rather be miserable and saved than comfortable and lost. And in that message, I, I didn't listen to the whole thing, but parts and pieces of it, he talked about a woman, that a man came in her life, and... This man could provide her with all kinds of things that she might want in life that she didn't have at that time. The only problem is, is that man wasn't saved. And so that woman had to make a decision. And that decision was to be joined to that man. That man could provide for her things that she did not have and maybe would never have in her life. Or stay in her, the state that she was in, in the state of need, and continue to live for God. And she decided to stay living for God, stayed in the church. You will be at times tempted. There are temptations that will come to you, and you have to make that decision. Will you be like the unrighteous, the ungodly that lives for now? 
You might enjoy the sin for a season. You might live comfortably. You might get the big house. You might have a lot of money in the bank. But are you saved? And Brother Wayne Huntley preached. He said, I'd rather be miserable and saved than comfortable and lost. And that's what you see in the, the wisdom of Solomon, the contrast of those two individuals. Hallelujah. I thank God for the truth. And there will be times when we don't get necessarily what we want. And there may be times when it's really difficult, really hard to live for God. But in the end, salvation is our goal. All right? So I pray you've been encouraged by the wisdom of Solomon. It's one of the most important books in the Apocrypha. And in case you don't know, and I'm going to let you go, but these apocryphal books shaped a lot of the thinking of that New Testament church. So may the Lord bless you real good, I pray. Amen. God be with you. Give you health and strength and just prosper your life and bless your life. Because if it comes from Him, He doesn't add any sorrow with it. Hallelujah. So go in peace. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. So you're dismissed tonight. God bless you.